easy. The idea is, well, first, you have your arms and rows around jumping nets. This can be a little bit. And then they send up graphic signals into a filling in layer. And you know that you have to be able to fill in either very small regions or very big regions. So you have to be able to have a kind of filling in that can spread from location to location. So the simplest idea is it diffuses from cell to cell. But you don't want it to be able to spread forever, so you can have boundaries here, which if the boundaries here it blocks the diffusion, it acts as a diffusion, diffusive gate. So the intuitive idea then is you have the time rate of change of the activity of the IJ diffusion cell, it can decay, and then you have diffusion uh, from other cells to you and reduced activity from the cell. And you can do it only insofar as you have enough permeability to spread. And the permeability goes down dramatically if you have a boundary. So you have boundary gate of diffusion. And the nice thing about this concept is it explains a lot of data. A lot of data. Let me just tell you a little bit. Well, the first data is over here. So this is a cross section of luminance profile with an input. So you have two light steps on a dark background. And first, you discount the aluminum using a shunting on several surround that. And that attenuates stuff away from boundaries and enhances it near boundaries. Then you build boundaries off these cusps. Then you take the discounted pattern and you put it into here. And you put the boundaries there to block the diffusion. And you have the rectangular profile becoming a rectangular profile. And you might say, oh my god. You know, it's not a lot of work to do to get the identity transformation. <laughs> well, but I said the magic words, this can't be illuminant, because here you shine a light on one end of the figure, that makes everything get uh, more luminous at this end, but the light is preserving ratios. And since shunting that's love ratios, it discounts the illuminant because you can around because of the ends. So this is a kind of minimal way to try to have the critical perception while discounting the aluminum. Well, this ratio of sensitivity is a double-edged sword because it also can create non critical perception. So for example, here, I have two equally luminous steps, but one is on a lighter background, one is on a darker background. So this has a higher ratio than this, when you discount the illuminant, this is going to look brighter. Well, brightness contrast is a good thing in a lot of cases. Okay. It also has implications. I know there's at least one philosophy in the audience. And here's a really lovely implication, which is very much like the Arbus data. Let's say I have an illumination gradient here. Okay. Well, when I discount the lumen and compute my boundaries, I'm still going to have these visible contrast changes. But, and they're going to be, uh, how to say, there's a brightness contrast effect here because look, these have the same luminance here. So this is bright, brighter than that. But I no longer see the illumination gradient. So this is a visible effect of an invisible cause. So, you know, it raises the issue all over again. You know, how do we do this as we do, given that we live in a world of illusion? And finally, there's the opposite of brightness contrast that also happens, which is called brightness assimilation. Here's a kind of profile that was introduced by Shapley and Reed, where these two things have the same luminance, these steps alongside have the same luminance. And the percept of this, this gets darkened by this. So this is less, less bright than that. And Shapley and Reed said, well, you can't have a model that gives you contrast and assimilation using the same mechanisms. Well, it's just not true. Here's a counterexample, even though this may not be the whole truth. But there are people who still claim it, like Dale Purvis just published a big paper saying you can't do it. Well, you can do it. So you try to get co constancy by discounting the illuminant. It can give you contrast and assimilation. And it can also explain things like the Craig O'Brien corn sweet effect. 
uh, this is really worth looking at if you haven't seen it. You have a baseline of, cons of equal luminance. You have a more luminous cusp next to a less luminous cusp. When you discount the aluminum and go through the boundaries, you see two steps of brightness, which is the same thing that you would see if you actually had two steps of brightness. And this seems like a no-brainer in the model, but it's led to huge controversies in the history of our field, if you want to discuss with me during the day, I'll tell you. Well, you can explain a lot more subtle things, but for homework, um, why not try out anomalous brightness differentiation between Knitz and Minguzzi. The Italians have always been wonderful at thinking of these things. I don't know what it is about that peninsula. Uh, if you do this under the right conditions, this sector is a little brighter than this sector, even though they're just surrounded by an annulus and a disk and the two lines aren't symmetric. So. Think about it, it's an immediate consequence of what we can see. Okay, but you might be saying, hey, hey, I don't believe in filling in, like people like Dan Bennett don't believe in filling in, or didn't believe in filling in, and now does believe in filling in. Well, uh, Mike Cardiz and Kanakiyama had read the paper that I did with Dan Thorovich, and they said, well, should we believe in filling in? And so they figured, let's test it. So they had a really clever experiment in which they flesh on a disk. And then after that, flesh on a masking stimulus and have subjects give them their judgments of what they saw. And if the theory were right, you would get a feature contour here, which would start spreading in here. And then there'd be some kind of obstruction over here. And these are the kinds of obstructions they found with different uh, stimuli here. And they got their cross sections uh, estimated. And they said, hey, well, you know, filling in may be there, but can the Grossberg and Todorovic model, which was just done at equilibrium, can not really explain that? So my student, Carl Arrington, rose to the challenge and took the model and simulated all their data. And so this is one of these cross sections and how it evolves in time. And I believe it even got on this uh, the cover of that vision research. So there's a lot of evidence that something like this is going on. Uh, let me also remark that these ideas, although simple, are quite serious in technological applications. So, for example, Jim Williamson, and Mendola, and I uh, developed uh, these ideas to try to deal with synthetic aperture radar images to give us a system that automatically compensates for variable illumination, which in this case can be five orders of magnitude of power in the radar return generates a multiple scale boundary segmentation that suppresses noise, regularizes boundaries and completes them, and then fills in surface representations using boundary, boundary data diffusion. And so we tested these on 512 by 512 star images. So Xerox is a never good way to show you anything. So this is all pretty washed out. But the main thing to think about is this does have many orders of magnitude of power. When you go through the shining on center off surround net, it automatically normalizes the image and in each region picks out the relative contrast. <laughs> then out of that, you can build uh, the boundaries. And what the boundaries are doing, this is so dense you can't see it, is you know, you can have lots and lots of pixels here that are high intensity but really not saying anything good about the image. So they would be noise even though they're high intensity. <coughs> So the idea is, is that a group thing is going to connect pixels that have some kind of coherence in terms of shared orientation, etc. And then you're going to just smooth over the pixels that aren't separated by groupings. And so this gives a reconstruction of the scene with a, a road and those little posts on the road, and there's a road under it, and there's your forest. And this gave a really you know, very competitive reconstruction of the scene. And by going into laminar circuits, if you look at a little piece of the scene, like just a tiny little piece of the road here, then you can see that you get much better resolution of small as well as large structure. And it has better analog sensitivity because we've got a better solution of the 
analog coherence problem, it runs much faster, and it just gives you better uh, image processing. So, um, we can't stop there, because so far, all we've talked about is relative likeness. And the question is, how do you choose an absolute likeness scale? In particular, how is white calibrated? This is called the anchoring problem. Well, there have been a lot of ideas about how anchoring goes on in history. One idea for the Helsing is that the average luminance should be gray. And in some cases, when you convert an image here to the average luminance gray, it's where it's gray. But then you take an image like this, and it just darkens the whole image. Well, another very popular and useful rule uh, was developed by Hans Wallach, who's one of the real greats of our field. He introduced the highest luminance as white rule. So if you take this image, though, and you take this light source as the highest luminance, the rest of the scene will plunge into darkness. Well, my, my student Simon Hong and I have tried to get at this a little better by doing a blurred highest luminance as white rule. So we spatially average the luminances and use that to rescale the image. And then the main problem that Wallach faces is handled pretty well. So Simon, uh, Hong, and I are, have a paper in press where we suggest a very similar kind of system to the one we saw before, but then you have also automatic gain control in the system that is uh, sensitive to this blurred highest luminance, and it rescales the cells to use their full dynamic range. So I want you to just think about the main issue. The main issue is, it's crucial to have relative contrast without saturation, but that can cool you down to a very small part of the dynamic range. You want to really use your full dynamic range. In addition, you might have said, oh my god, you know, diffusion for filling in, doesn't that run really slow? Well, what Simon and I pointed out was that you can have horizontal connections, long-range horizontal connections, that operate very fast, that are gated by boundary signals, and you can get a thousand-fold speed up. Okay, so now it runs real fast, and you might think, okay, horizontal connections in the boundary system, horizontal connections in the surface system, you know, what's the analog there? So, so you can get very fast filling in, if you have horizontal connections, just like the grouping, but they're not quite, they're not a bipole, right? They're not grouping inwardly, they're spreading out with the physicality here, and they're getting gated along their pathways. In any case, you can explain a lot of data that you couldn't explain without anchoring in this way. In particular, uh, Gilchrist has been very active in studying anchoring, and he has a whole series of anchoring type properties that we've not quantitatively simulated. One being that figures on a black background, this is a black background, that are intensely illuminated, so this would be in front of the background, okay, that as you get more and more uh, articulated regions here, the dark ones look darker, but the white ones remain white. And in the limit of just having one black here, that's the famous Gelb effect. You can have a black, you shine a bright light on it, it looks white. And so, this is a, just to illustrate this, I can't really go through the details. This is uh, his data on the articulation of it. Here's a simulation, and here's the Gelb effect. It always looks white. So in summary, all I want to say here is that by including anchoring in whatever theory you have, you can now deal with realistic color imagery. And these are just some examples of before and after that Simon and I simulated and compared it with the latest versions of the Rednex model that's used uh, by PD when it's quite competitive. I want to end this section by not just being scientific. You know, when you think about vision a lot and you look out on the world, there are a lot of visual artists out there in Rwanda 
Have we learned anything about the struggles that visual artists have gone through to represent the world? And I think the answer is at least partially yes. And I personally love this example of Matisse's struggle because Matisse wrote in his book Jazz about the internal conflict between drawing and color. Okay, so what by drawing, what does he mean? Instead of drawing an outline and filling in the color, I am drawing directly in color. So he didn't want to draw a boundary and then fill in the color. Well, why didn't he? Well, because in the fall of movement, you want to have luminous, bright colors. And if you draw boundaries, you can darken your colors. So what Matisse realized was that if he just drew in the bright color patches, that in the boundary system, it would create invisible amodal boundaries that would organize these colors into surfaces. And therefore, he didn't have to draw the boundaries because he just had to organize them so that they generated a surface person without darkening his colors. So Matisse instinctively knew that all boundaries are invisible, but how the hell do you say that without a theory? It's just so weird. So anyway, here are some of his colors. It's dark in here, it's very bright. The roof of Collier, you know how he does this, just patches of color that group into the surface properties. And uh, here we have the open window, you know, patches of color that grouping, and then you also will use lines too. So it's sort of like a virtuoso uh, declaration that I understand that all boundaries are invisible. Anyway, so so much for filling in. Um, now I'd like to go into the world of depth, so we've been talking a little about the world of color, now we have to talk a little bit about the world of depth. And so one can start that by just raising the issue, well, let's talk about 3D surface filling in. So this would go from filling in of surface lightness and color to filling in of surface and depth. Well, the immediate question is, does the same process fill in all three? You fill in depth the same way you fill in color? Well, I would claim the answer to that is yes. But that seems really weird, because then it would mean that a change in lightness could cause a change in depth, because they're both using the same filling in mechanism. Well, does that happen? Well, the answer is yes. Okay the phenomenon called proximity luminance for variation. But then you might say, well, what really disturbs me about this is why isn't depth more unstable when lighting changes? If you're going to be so sensitive to depth being the same process as filling in color. And I claim one reason for that is you discount the illumination. You stabilize the image a lot by compensating very early on for those variable lighting Okay, so we're going to focus for a little bit of how does the cortex handle binocular vision. And most models of binocular vision that of neurophysiological substrates considered only B1. There's a famous disparity of energy model. And most models don't include cortical layers. So it's a natural question to ask, can this laminar approach be self-consistently extended to 3D vision? And here, the first step in doing this was with my student, Pierce Howe, who I think I saw Pierce in the audience. Pierce is now uh, at Harvard Medical School. And we introduced a 3D laminar model that, again, was a fusion of two other models. First, the laminar model that I just described. And what I like to call the facade model of 3D vision. I've been working on 3D vision with a number of very gifted students before. Well, why did I call it the facade model? Again, this is philosophically interesting. So here we have a facade from the New Yorker magazine. Well, what facade means is form and color and depth. And I call it form and color and depth because the claim is that the brain multiplexes form and color and depth. Uh, and individual cells can be sensitive to these combinations 
of properties which are all context sensitive. And because of that, you know, the name facade reminds us of how the world can look so real uh, without great representations forming into the trap of naive realism. In other words, the facade may have a certain appearance, but that's not the same as the mechanism that's generating. And so every cell is highly multiplexed, highly context sensitive in everything I'm saying to you. Now, when the work appears, we simulated a lot of data about 3D vision, 22 different simulations. I can't explain all that to you today, but what I want to show you is how the model naturally generalizes. It needn't have generalized that every stage of work you could be hitting the brick wall and everything has to be thrown away. So the fact that it generalizes and it does it in such an elegant way, I think indicates to us that we're on the right track. So, what are some of the issues that uh, Pierce and I try to deal with? The first is, how do you unify contrast-specific binocular fusion with contrast-invariant boundary perception? Well, we already know what the contrast-invariant issue is. It's, you know, how do you get this gray boundary in front of texture? And here we say we have to pull over opposite contrast polarity. On the other hand, we also know that when you're doing fusion of images to the two eyes, let's say this is the left eye view and the right eye view, you can fuse a black gray with a black gray. Same polarity. You can fuse a white gray with a white gray. Same polarity. But you really can fuse a black gray with a white gray, which is opposite. And so the question is, how do you have light polarity fusion and opposite polarity fooling all in the same system? Okay. Well, the brain does it in quite a lovely way, it seems. So <laughs> we know that by the time you get to 2-3, you're going to have complex cells where you're fooling over opposite contrast polarities. And you know that in layer four of E1, you have polarity-specific oriented filters, namely the simple cells. Well, it doesn't give you a lot of give. It has to be somewhere between layer four and layer two, three. So you're in a tight box here, and the question is, whoops, is this going to work, or are we going to die here? Well, it turns out that in layer 3B, there are lots of polarity-specific binocular simple cells. And so the claim is, is that the first stages in binocular fusion are going to go on when you take light polarity inputs from the left eye and the right eye, and they're going to combine to give you a disparity sensitive binocular simple cell, polarity specific cell in layer 2, 3, I'm sorry, in layer 3B, and then opposite polarity binocular simple cells, dark light and light dark in 3D, are going to activate shared complex cells that give you a contrast invariant boundary in layer 2, 3A. Okay, well, the second, uh, the second issue is how do you implement then what's called the contrast constraint on binocular fusion? So if you're trying to fuse the same object as seen through the two eyes, you would expect that it's going to have the same contrast. And if you do have the same contrast in the left and right eye view, you're going to get one kind of fusion per cell. But if you change the contrast of one of them relative to the other, you're going to get a totally different kind of fusion per se. This is Suzanne McKeon, our colleagues at the school. So how do you get this contrast sensitivity to begin to help you to match only signals from the same object? Well, the claim is that in addition to the excitatory disparity fusion in layer 3D, you also are going to have inhibitory and neurons here that are inhibiting each other and the target binocular simple cell. And this creates a property called an obligate cell 
And an obligate cell fires only if it gets sufficient input from both the left and right eye. And you might immediately say, hey, this is starting to look even like a bipolar cell. You know, are we repeating the same properties with variations on the theme over and over again? Anyway, so here it illustrates a simulation of that so-called ratio constraint on binocular fusion, where against the log of a contrast of a higher contrast bar in one eye, you plot the log of the minimum contrast that allows <coughs> matching the other eye, and you see when one is higher contrast, the other is higher contrast. So that's sort of the obligate property. Well, that helps to solve the correspondence problem. But it doesn't fully solve it. Where the correspondence problem is, is that there are lots of false matches that can occur when you try to mix together left and right eye inputs. Like, how do you know that this thing shouldn't be matched with that thing? And the brain has to sort that out. Well, the claim is that this is done in D2, where there's something we like calling a disparity field which first came out of work that I did with my student, Mom Glaufman, who's now in England. And so the idea is if you put together these left and right eye views, you need to have some kind of competitive interaction here to knock out the false matches. Okay. Well, we the false matches are going to be suppressed by a line of sight inhibition. So here is a line of sight inhibition. All these things are going to be inhibiting each other. And you're also going to have an addition across depth within the same cyclopean position. You're going to have this kind of addition. So you're going to have an inhibitory network in D2 with very simple rules of firing together, wiring together, and being at the same location that are going to help eliminate some of these false matches. What's well, another theme we need to do? But don't worry, it doesn't go on forever. I just want you to know what some of the issues are. Another issue is, how does monocular information contribute to that? Well, when we look at the world, because things are sticking out in 3D, and each eye views the world from slightly different locations, sometimes you're only going to see part of an object with one eye. Okay, and this is an example of that. If, let's say, these are your stimuli to surfaces in 3D, um, the right eye here uh, is only, Let's just look at it. Both the left and the right eye can see this thing. Oh, no, do I have this wrong? I'm getting confused. Which one can only the right eye see? Uh, oh, it's a, whatever it is. You can see it better than I. When I get confused, I get really confused. OK, but you, you can see what the issue is, is that there are going to be parts of the scene that only one eye can see. And so the question is, how do you figure out what depth those things should be at? Why isn't something that you see <coughs> always seen at optical infinity? And so the idea in the model is the simplest thing you can think of, that there's a monocular stream and a binocular stream of information. And you just combine the binocular and the monocular information as soon as you get into V2 where it's going to be acted on by things like the disparity filter. The next issue is that, well, so far we're going to be talking about boundaries. The question is, how do we form surfaces? We've already seen a bit of that because here, all we have here to give you a notion of depth is matching the disparity of these vertical lines. Everything else here is totally ambiguous in this black thing when it comes to that. So the first thing is, how do we fill in a surface? And the second thing is, how do we put it at the right depth? Well, one key point is that you need to have a closed boundary in order to contain your surface filling in. So if you have a closed boundary, the filling in is contained. But if you have a big gap in the boundary, stuff is going to flow out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use filling in here in order to assign likenesses and colors to the correct depth and fill in the surfaces only selectively there. So the way in which this happens is as follows. 
Let's say you have a scene where you just had one binocular vertical boundary, and then the rest of the scene was seen monocularly. So let's say these horizontal boundaries, well, they don't have a definite disparity. And let's say this vertical boundary due to the Vinci stereopsis was only seen by one eye. Well, what do you do with the horizontal boundaries? Well, they don't have any depth. So the hypothesis has been that you just project these uh, boundaries that don't have any depth to all the depth planes. Well, in this depth here, you're going to have a closed boundary, so it can support filling in. But in this depth here, you don't have a closed boundary, so the surface quality will flow out. So we're going to lift the surface qualities to this depth, even though the surface inputs went to all depths. And in fact, Arash Yazdenbach has just done psychophysics to test. Is it the case that horizontal boundaries are projected to all depths? And is it the case that uh, only closed contours support surface filling in? And I'm happy to say the results are supportive of this hypothesis. <clears throat> OK. So that's all it was. Uh, when it came to the work with uh, peers. Here is the model where you have your obligate cells, you have your convergence of monocular and binocular cells, you go through your disparity filter, and then you control your filling in the banana that I just described. And peers and I noted that there's a lot of neurophysiological evidence uh, to support this <coughs> hypothesis. Let me just mention a couple of key things. This V1 layer 3D, it has simple cells that are monocular and binocular. Remember, you have a monocular and a binocular channel here. By the time you get to layer 2, 3A, that has many complex cells. It has some monocular cells too, and binocular cells. Remember, you haven't yet fused the monocular and binocular channels yet. But by the time you get to V2, the cells are binocular activated by both eyes, and that's why in the model it fuses all the information as soon as you get to the two. So Piers and I were able to simulate a ton of data that way, but I don't want to stop there because additional work that Tim is moving very quickly with my colleagues uh, Young Kang Kao and Yang Fang. Piers and I didn't need perceptual grouping, but for a lot of data you do need grouping. And so we already know about light bulbs. But now we have to ask a more subtle question, which is how does 3D grouping override local disparities? And Ramachandran and the fourth and Kausch and Wilde going back 30 some odd years show that global grouping can override point-to-point -point local disparities if you put them in contention in the scene. And so in the model, we claim that the disparity filter for eliminating false matches to solve the correspondence problem, and the 3D grouping process for eliminating weak and incorrect groupings, that they're the same thing, that they're all false groupings. So we suggest that the disparity filter is just integrated into the 3D bipolar grouping in V2, layer 2, 3A. So all of these inhibitory constraints we claim are part of the selectivity whereby the right 3D grouping will be created. Well, I need to tell you one last theme here, and that theme has to do with surface to boundary feedback. Remember, we talked about boundary-to-surface interactions. The boundaries gate the filling in of surfaces. But you also have to have feedback from the surfaces back to the boundaries, which makes the whole notion of a stream a little subtle. They're complementary streams, but then they're interacting so much that if you're recording from one, you're always going to be picking up properties from the other, which is what some people wonder should be even called in a stream. But the question is, why do you have to start this boundary feedback? 
And as I just remarked, the boundaries and surfaces obey complementary rules. But then the question is, from these complementary rules, how do you get a unified, consistent person? And the claim is that the feedback assures that you have consistent boundaries and surfaces, and it eliminates extra boundaries that would otherwise interfere with object recognition. <coughs> this is a whole story in its own right, but for the moment, I just want to indicate that um, uh, here is what the picture we had before, where these surfaces no longer matter. But when you have your surface to boundary feedback, the surface system tells the boundary system, hey, this was a good boundary. Let me strengthen it. And hey, this boundary was a bad boundary. I'm going to inhibit it. And that operates through very simple rules, just like the ones I just told you. Uh, and if you do that, then you get the model in its present form. And now if you look at V1 and V2, they start looking like variations on a theme. And you know, that's really a, an issue. Are they variations on a theme? And here again, we can explain a ton more data with Young Kang is uh, giving a talk, Young Kang Kao, and Liang Kao Fang is giving a poster. This is a simulation with Liang. And uh, what it shows is uh, if you take stereograms, which have very many possible confusions in solving the correspondence problem, and you put it through the model, then you can pull out the objects at different depths and separate it from the background. In previous models, like Marcoggio, which is really a version of Parvati Dev and George Sterling's model, you know, you would get a disparity map, and then you'd have a little homunculus in the machine, try to pull everything up to the right surface. But here I claim that lightness, color, and depth are all done by the same filling process, and this is what I mean. And you can get a feeling of how the thing works. I don't know if you can see them, it's a little obscure. The initial boundaries are pretty messy, but when the loop closes, you get really, really neat boundaries. And um, uh, in, at the present state of knowledge, we can now do 27 simulations with one set of properties. Now I do want to uh, tell you a little bit about the ground separation. Um, well, I think we just, mm, I'm going to have to skip that because I want to tell you about motion perception. So there are a lot of things I knew I was going to skip, but Basically, we know a lot about 3D figure ground separation and modal perception, uh, transparency. There's a lot of really uh, exciting work going on in vision, but uh, you can do just so much. So uh, my last uh, theme will be to give you just a taste of some of the things you know about motion. So here, this is an important problem for survival and also for technology because you have to analyze how the brain uses spatially disjoint and ambiguous motion signals in clutter to derive coherent, unambiguous representations of object motion. So I'll try to spell it out in pictures. The main thing to keep in mind is that um, until now, a lot of our thinking has been in the ventral watt stream. But when you get into motion, you're going into the dorsal wave stream. And you might say, well, why does the brain need these parallel streams to do, let's say, form processing and motion processing? If you go into V1, you know, the earliest cells in V1 are already sensitive to orientation and they have some motion sensitivity. So why did you have to create this huge amount of extra tissue in these two parallel streams? There must be a fundamental reason. Well, there's a lot of evidence for parallel processing of the form, like V1, D1, D4, and motion form for the V1 MT. But why do you have to do 
Well, I think an easy way to get into this is to think about the different geometries of static point and motion form just as an existence proof. So if I ask you, what's the opposite of orientation vertical? I think you all say it's horizontal. That's 90 degrees. But if I ask you, what's the opposite direction of up? I think you all say down, which is 180 degrees. So orientation and direction have different symmetries. And this is easily seen, for example, if you look at negative after effects. If I show you this kind of uh, display for a while, and you look at a blank screen, you'll see a negative after effect uh, of concentric circles, the so-called Nkaya movie, where each of these is about 90 degrees from those. So those are the opposite orientations. And if you see the <coughs> flowing down for a while, and <coughs> You look at a blank screen, and you'll see an impression of stuff moving up, which is an amazing piece, the so-called waterfall version. And if you ask, how does that happen? Well, I'd say, gain the dipoles, rebounds, rebounds, but in different circuits. OK, so the claim is, is that computing boundary orientation and computing motion direction are complementary to each other, that the watt stream is doing a lot of orientational processing. And you have to have very precisely aligned orientations to get this good disparity matching that I've just been talking to you about in the division. On the other hand, if you want to compute a good motion direction, well, I can be a vertical moving to the right, I can be a obliques moving to the right. All these different orientations can move to the right. So to get a good motion direction, like look at this image here. This region is moving diagonally upward, I have a vertical light dark and a horizontal dark light, both moving to the diagonally to the right. You have to pool over these different orientations moving in the same direction in order to get a good directional signal. Okay? And it's because of that that if you look in the watt form stream, you get really good stereo, but you have coarse directional and if you go into the wear stream, you have really good direction, but of course stereo. And in fact, if you look in uh, the watt stream, I didn't comment on it, but here's some nice data from Dan Collins' lab. If you record at least from certain <coughs> complex cells to drifting bars, they get the same cell can respond really vigorously to stuff moving to the right and to stuff moving to the left. So that's not very good directional sensitivity. So the issue was that in trying to build a complex cell that's insensitive to directional contrast, it's all too easy to get it also to be able to respond to both directions of motion. So that the first challenge in trying to break through here was to try to design a motion filter that's insensitive to direction of contrast. It's just like at the corner of the diagonal moving thing. You want to be able to pool like darks and dark lights to get a good directional signal. It should be insensitive to direction of contrast, but you do want it to be sensitive to direction of motion. And this already started with my colleague Mike Rudd in the 80s. But that's not all you need to do. A motion filter is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Just as in the form stream, you need filtering and grouping in the motion stream. And that is absolutely essential to solve the so-called aperture problem, because if I have a, a line moving in an aperture, locally I can't tell if it's going orthogonal to the line or in any of these directions, but within an ambiguous aperture, no matter what direction it's really going in, even if it's going to the right or it's going up, it'll always look like it's going perpendicular here. So you have to be able to disambiguate the real direction to overcome this aperture ambiguity. So you have to be able to integrate signals of the space to know what signals belong to the right object, as well as segregate signals from different objects. And to do that, accumulating evidence says that you use what are called feature tracking signals. So for example, if you have a line moving up, the whole length of the line is ambiguous. All of these directions are possible. But the two ends of the line, the two ends of the line give you good feature tracking signals that you can use to disambiguate the true direction. 
But then you have to ask, well, how does such a small set of good signals overwhelm such a huge set of ambiguous signals? Somehow these guys have to be amplified, and these guys have to be attenuated, and then somehow these guys are going to have to be able to spread across space. They're going to have to group inwardly, if you like, to capture the right direction. And in fact, a classic example of that is due to the Dwala, where you have a barber pole and you have lines moving across. And the evidence there is that the unambiguous signals moving horizontally <coughs> do capture the direction inside. So there's some kind of inward propagation and capture motion direction. So the same thing is true outside in the world. This is an example of the famous leaping leopard where you have a leopard lunging at you under a forest canopy, and its muscles are surging, and there are shadows falling through the jungle treetops, moving along its coat. And so the local directions of motion on its spots and on the shadows on its body are going every which way. The only thing that's really showing you the direction it's moving might be the set of measure zero at its bounding contours. So how do you use this very sparse set of signals to capture all these ambiguous guys so you can get a coherent object motion direction in time to save your life, if you like? And so this is called motion capture, and it is a form of apparent motion. So a key thing that we have to do is not only do we have to solve the aperture problem and do the motion movement, but we also have to be able to use the good stereo estimates to pull out the core stereo estimates of the motion system so that we can have good moving form and depth. So what our real goal here is to understand form motion interactions to overcome the complementary weaknesses of the form and motion streams. And a really lovely example of such four motion interactions was uh, presented by Ramachandran, where what Ramachandran did was at one time you'd have a Knitsa square next to just some random jumble of lines. And in the next time interval, he closed the pac man, turned them into discs, and he opened uh, an illusory square region here. And if you do that, you see a square moving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth through time. And why this was an important demonstration is because in this frame, the inducers of this square are totally different from the inducers of this square. So these emergent boundaries are occurring in the form system. Okay? But the only thing that you can match between those squares are the emergent squares themselves, not their inducers. And that illusory motion is going on back and forth in the motion stream. So this is a kind of double illusion. It's, um, uh, you have illusory contrast in the form stream and then apparent motion in the motion stream. Now you might say, well, why the hell should I worry about apparent motion? Well, in the forest primeval, it's really important because let's say there's a predator or a prey and they're running behind the clues. So you're going to have flash, 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 flash. And you want to be able to build a continuous motion trajectory to track the critter or you may get into bad trouble either through starvation or becoming a meal. And so we have to study apparent motion. Almost everything we see is apparent motion. And that brings us back into the really early stages of the development of vision with the gestaltists who studied uh, things like beta motion. So for example, it's known that if you just have a flash and another flash, a flash and another flash with the right spatial temporal conditions, <coughs> you're going to see uh, a wave of apparent motion going from one to the other. And what's really remarkable about these flashes is that if I separate the two spots and I make the same 
time interval between them, the same inner stimulus interval, this motion may be half as fast as that motion. And this raises really interesting philosophical issues because on the one hand, if there's just one approach, there's no motion. If you have two or more properly timed and positioned flashes, you get apparent motion. But the question is, why isn't the long-range influence of a single flash perceived as motion? How do individual, <coughs> well, I don't want to read this. Let me just say what it is. I mean, so one flash occurs, there's no motion. A while later, and then another flash occurs. And somehow, this thing starts connecting to that. But this is already over. So if it's over, how the hell does it know how fast it has to connect to that? So you're going to see that when it happens. It's an ESP problem, you know, sort of knowing what happened before it happened. It's just sort of like the things we talk about in art, but there's a different mechanism. So the intuitive idea here is that the answer, the answer is really simple. Or have a proposed answer. So let's say we just have a flash, okay? And the claim is going to be that that is going to activate a Gaussian receptive field. What could be more innocuous than that? On the other hand, it's going to take a while to activate that receptive field. So when I turn on the flash, the cells are going to get activated, and then they're going to get decay. So then what is the Gaussian receptive field going to do? It's going to get more and more active through time. And then it's going to decay. It's going to wax and it's going to wane. <coughs> and in fact, we know that stuff like that happens. People like Anstis and Ramachandran have estimated this decay in influence through time. That decaying influence is there. So let's consider now what happens when you have two flashes. So one flash occurs, another flash occurs. And suppose that the effect of the first flash is waning when the second flash is waxing or increasing. And suppose that they're close enough to be within their Gaussian receptive field. So when the first flash is waning, the second flash will be waxing. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to add up the sum of those two Gaussian. And if I add up the sum of the two Gaussians, then as one wanes and the other waxes, the peak is going to move continuously through time. And if I imagine that I'm going to have a contrast enhancing competition picking out the peak, I'm just going to have a continuous wave of activation, which I call a Gauss wave or a G wave. And the point is, this is all these properties. So all you, all you have is your Gaussian receptive field with some contrast enhancement, then uh, you're going to get those properties. So the, what, the answer, why don't you, why aren't you aware of the long range influence when only one flash occurs? One flash occurs, it's Gaussian waxes and wanes. Where's its peak? It's always there. It doesn't move. Okay. But when I give you an answer like this, you, sh you shouldn't say, oh yeah, sure, you know, because you should read the other theories of the kind of motion, okay, which get into all of this stuff, I mean. So you have to know how to think about this. So then the question is, how does the velocity go up if the distance goes up, if the time interval between flashes is constant? Well, you just prove the theorem. It just says you can get to the halfway mark at a time that doesn't depend on distance, it speeds up. That's the way it works. And using that simple idea uh, with an appropriate filter, Mike and I, Mike Rudd and I were able to simulate a ton of classical data. Okay. So we have to look a little more at what that filter is. And there have been a string of very gifted students who've worked with Enya Mikola and me on further developing this. So this is the way this kind of system <coughs> looks at the present time. Let me just tell you what the stages are. So after the input comes in, you're going to activate transient cells. So the brain is very sensitive to transients. And this early stage 
gives you a very, very weak kind of directional sensitivity. It just vetoes non-preferred local directions. Then you go through a short-range filter, and this accumulates evidence within a direction and polarity, but it accumulates the evidence across space, and this accumulation of evidence enhances feature tracking signals. So if I have a good directional signal locally, I can accumulate that evidence and get a stronger feature tracking then competitive interactions further enhance the feature tracking signals and weaken those ambiguous signals in the middle of the line, for example. But this isn't yet a true directional signal, because to get a true directional signal, remember I took the corner of that figure where you could have a vertical light dark and a horizontal dark light both moving diagonally, we have to pool across space, across orientation, and across polarity, as well as across eyes. So we have a long-range filter that accumulates evidence within direction, but across orientation, space, polarity, and eyes. This is like the homolog of a complex cell, which does the same thing for the form system. This still hasn't solved uh, the, the, the motion capture problem. To solve the motion capture problem, the claim is you go into a directional grouping network. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, now. <clears throat> OK, but let me also raise a related issue, because I'm going to talk about grouping things in depth. So when I have this gray object moving uh, with respect to this stationary black object, uh, usually you will perceive the black object as an includer and the gray object as being partially occluded by the black object. And what I had to skip, regrettably, was how the system that I was telling you about will attach this boundary to the occluder and detach it from the occluded object. And so Ken Akiyama and colleagues like calling this an intrinsic boundary that belongs to this figure. And this is extrinsic, it belongs to the occluder. So in what I'm going to be talking about you now, we're going to be assuming that the input is going to be coming from the form system, which is already separated figure from background in this way. The way in which it happens in the form system is to use bipolar cells. Because one of the properties, remember we emphasize this cooperative competitive property, if you're at an occluded boundary, the cooperation is going to favor the occluder, and it's going to break away the boundary of the occluded object. And this little step is enough within the theory I already showed you to do free ground separation. So that the idea is, is that if you have visible occluders here, and if you look at the boundaries that are actually being projected into the depth of the occluder in the motion system, you're just going to have these boundaries at the far depth. Whereas if you don't have that occluder there, if you call it the invisible occluder case, you're going to have all these boundaries operating. And this difference between having the boundaries at the end of the, of the unoccluded object and not having the boundaries at the end of the occluded object make a huge difference in what you perceive. So that, for example, uh, I should mention these are simulations that Emmy and and I did with Lavinia this one upon. Um, let's suppose that you have this black object moving with respect to these visible occluders. You're not going to have strong boundary signals from here, but you are going to then be able to pool the ambiguous motion signals in their favorite direction. And so the net effect, if you can, I hope you can see these uh, little arrows, is that the motion is going to be perceived in the ambiguous motion direction. On the other hand, if outside, <coughs> you do have bars moving horizontally, 
then there, strong feature tracking signals can get amplified, and you're going to get motion grouping across this whole region, and that's going to capture this uh, direction to be seen horizontally, and there you see the motion capture. <coughs> Likewise, uh, suppose that you have uh, the rotation of a square behind four occluders, where you have visible occluders, these extrinsic boundaries, uh, I'm sorry, these boundaries here are, are extrinsic, they're not strong, but you're going to have all these ambiguous directions here that can group. If you remove the occluders, then you're going to have strong feature tracking signals here, and they're going to win, and so you're going to see these things moving up and down. And these are simulations of that. Here you have the up and down motion. And here you have the motion, the diagonal motion at that moment. And so with a lot of it, we've been able to simulate a whole lot of, um, of uh, data. But I just want to end my talk with just saying a little bit about this grouping process. And the key theme is how are both global motion direction and speed simultaneously determined by the grouping process. So one example of that, for example, is let's say you have a moving flare. So you have these flares moving like that with respect to each other. At some times, you're going to see each one moving with its own direction and speed. And then at the next moment, they're going to go here, and it'll seem like the whole thing is moving in a different direction with a new speed. So when you switch direction, you also switch speed. So the grouping process is controlling both direction and speed. So the question is, how do you determine the correct direction without messing up the estimates of speed. So if you're going to do a grouping process, first you're going to try to take signals from the same direction and have them try to activate a directional cell. And then you're going to have these different directional cells competing. And they're now going to try to feed back to support their own direction, but to kill off everyone else's direction by supporting their own direction without changing the signal much, you're also going to support the speed estimate that's in that direction. Okay, so the idea is support your direction without changing amplitude much, kill off all the other directions. Well, what is that? That is a top-down on-center-off-surround modulatory net. It's a top-down modulatory on-center-off-surround net in direction space. So it's the arc matching rule. So the claim here is a very strong prediction that if you go into MTMST feedback, that the process that carries out pre-attentive motion capture by closing the feedback loop and selecting the direction and speed consistent with the winning direction, that that process also carries out attentive directional climbing because it's like a top-down R prime. And the reason I claim it's there is to try to <coughs> learn these directional uh, receptive fields. So there's a major prediction which hasn't yet been tested, which is that um, pre-attentive motion capture and attentive directional priming use the same mst -MT feedback circuit. And it's through the operation of this feedback circuit. So maybe I can just draw this for you. So let's say I have a line, and it's been amplified. And these guys have been attenuated. And then I go through this bottom-up filter to activate a winning direction well, these amplified guys are going to help you win locally. They're going to feed back and try to pick out their direction without corrupting the speed. So 
when they feed back and look at all these ambiguous directions, they're going to be picking up the horizontal direction here, likewise here. Well then, when you feed back <coughs> down through the loop, the loop is just running, now you propagate it horizontal a little further, so now it's going to move in, and so it's going to propagate inwardly. In fact, Eric Pasquet has beautiful psychophysics showing that when you estimate the, the, the speed of moving lines, the data behave just like this. This kind of directional selection process going on through time. And so the claim is, in addition, that this feedback process selects the correct direction without distorting speed. Moreover, it's a predicted top-down modulatory on center off surround net which I claim is there to allow stable development and learning of directional receptive fields. Well, I hope you've found some points of interest in the talk today. I've had to skip over huge areas, not only in our research, but in research of many other investigators. I've used some of our research as a way of organizing other people's work. But I hope you see that this is an unbelievably rich and exciting area. I hope some of you uh, get attracted to it. There's a lot of wonderfully uh, interesting work to be done, but we need basic science on technology. Thanks again for your attention. And tomorrow we'll talk about sensory motor control, and uh, now it's time to go forward. So we'll come back at 10 30.